such a nightmare. So just be Fleming, you guys. You got this. Um, he has a lot of Aspies leaving the school as the place to do work and home as the place to relax. Um, so it can cause a lot of stress and anxiety when they get home and you have expectations for them to do work. And when you think about it, they are working twice as hard as typical kids because they are trying to navigate sensory issues, trying to decipher confusing uh, facial expressions and emotions and all sorts of things. Um, so the work environment is critical. So noise is actually okay. However, there's some caveats to that. So when you have lyrics, when they're listening to music with lyrics, that can distract them. But instrumentals are fine. I would avoid the kid pop stuff where it's, you know, the symphony playing a you know, pop song because they still know the words. Um, noise, uh, noise machines, um, all of that, fantastic. Um, turning off mobile devices if you can. Definitely silencing if, you know, if they're not getting that ping that's gonna distract them. Um, really being careful about restricting internet to just work, um, which can be a challenge. Um, and then having a really organized study space. So I put a picture of a kitchen in here because a lot of families think the kitchen is a great place to do homework. Mm -mm. It is the hub of the house. So people are coming and going and moving and grooving, right? So we are gonna have our kids get way more distracted in those situations. Um, also having, you know, folders, having a well-stocked area, lots of pencils that are sharpened um, to prevent them from having to get up and go do these things because the more often they have to leave that space, the longer it takes them to get that task done. Um, I really, really encourage backward planning, especially for longer tasks. Um, so it's a stepwise approach, right? So the first step is to ask yourself, okay, when is this task due, all right? And you wanna break it down into that long-term goal and then the shorter, short-term mini goals. Um, okay, so I know my project is due, this paper's due on the 28th, so I'm gonna first, um, or next, create this little mini steps, right? So I need to have my topic picked by the seventh. I need to then have my outline. And so you kind of just break it down so it's more manageable. Um, and this is a really important skill, especially as your um, kids potentially go to college, um, because you are going to work, um, you have long-term projects that, you know, you might feel overwhelmed by this huge thing that you have to do, but when you chunk it into these smaller, more manageable parts, that's better. Related to that, um, again, we're starting small, right, with that example. So you're finding a way to shrink it down, make it manageable. Um, those mini deadlines help with accountability, so we can check in. They're learning to check in with themselves. Um, rewards, right, so focusing on that feeling at the end, um, you know, I did it, or time outside is an example, um, and then making a public commitment something that's helpful with that too. So it can help us motivate when we openly say it to other people, I'm going to start a diet is an example some people give or start an exercise routine. The, when we do that, there's research that shows that you are more likely, not necessarily successful, but you are more likely to engage with that. Um, and then we also need to move away from this idea of a to-do list mindset. So I encourage study time or um, working time where instead of thinking of, okay, I've got X, Y, and Z to do for homework tonight. Um, when I'm done with those things, I'm done. Think of it as a, a set time period. So, and you know your kids in terms of how much time they can truly set. So whether it's 40 minutes um, to an hour for older kids, um, you know, having this established time that works within your schedule to say, okay, I've done X, Y, and Z, but I'm gonna keep working until that time period is up because you can work ahead Maybe you're studying for something, you're working on a long-term project, and it creates that routine and that structure and predictable aspects that Aspies like. Um, visual, this classroom should make everything visual. I'm serious, color code, use timers, but realize that if you work past that timer, they're not going to. Like if that, if you want them to work past the timer, they're not going to. Um, and a couple of us actually, um, and Callie has heard her too, if they're awards week a couple of weeks ago, and she's sort of executive function guru. Yeah. And she actually is getting away from timers okay. a little bit and really going to analog clocks. Does it cause anxiety with the beeping? Is that a factor she's talking Somewhat, about? Somewhat, the kids really don't, can't, they're not really seeing the, or understanding fully the elastic time, so they'll okay. actually draw, on dra with dry use markers, okay. on analog clocks with magnetic frames and glass tops, and use one color to show, well, I've already done this for 10 minutes, 
but I still have 10 minutes more for this. And oh, I like that. That's a double. Color. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting. And she has studied timing and pacing and, and is really um, emphasizing the use of analog clocks. Mm -hmm. Well, it helps with understanding the passage of time. And right. the passage of time, because yeah. so many of our kids really don't. Just like that. Yeah. Yeah. What is going on? Right. Right. Can't tell right. time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the yeah. clock phase. Yeah. Definitely mm -hmm. talk to you about that. Yeah, it's interesting um, stuff. Yeah. Related list schedules. Um, assign times for when things should be completed. The more specific, the better. Um, related to that, routines, be explicit. Um, any kind of rules, you know, it has to be concrete. Put it up on a poster board somewhere, something. Um, warn them whenever you can about changes in these routines because that's gonna be stressful. They're gonna have a hard time with it. Um, and then also praise them for when they show flexibility or when they don't overreact. Um, really make a big, point to let them know you're proud of how they persevered, how they handled that, their effort. Um, maybe they were trying to use skills to cope. Um, and then incorporating special interests whenever possible. So whether it's a math problem about Animal or about Mario and Luigi or Fortnite or trains or whatever. Um, art, you know, again, there's movement associated with art, getting them to draw things. Um, allowing time to, um, you know, get them to do their interests during breaks or um, recess. Just any any opportunity to build on the things that they're passionate about, it's gonna tune them into what's going on. Um, and then your speech is so important. So wanting to make sure that your voice isn't being, A, drowned out by all the background noise, potentially from the classroom is important. Um, pausing between sentences to help them allow time for processing. Um, that's a great strategy because a lot of times we are just giving multiple steps at a time and we need to have a true intentional pause. Um, avoiding sarcasm or hints at meanings. Um, I had somebody share an example with me where some teacher alluded to a quiz being different than usual or just something and then the poor child second they had all of the answers correct all of them and then because the teacher had said there was something different. They thought everything must be wrong. So they re they erased every single item on that test. Um, so you have got to be very clear um, and explicit. Um, also, you need to make sure that you are repeating instructions. Repetition, repetition. Make sure that to have them say it back to you um, to, to make sure they get clarification. Um, and you know, also it might sound silly, but you have to be very, very clear in ways that you might not expect. So if the expectation is for kids to wait outside in the hallway, then you need to say, I need you to wait right here until you're told to come into the classroom, as opposed to hold on, wait guys, right? So the more explicit in terms of your request or instructions, the better. Um, you know, even if it's like, instead of, all right, everybody, hello, it's let's all look to the front of the classroom. Um, so, you know, um, that's a big factor. And then another thing too that I always like to encourage people to remember is don't assume that behavior is being defiant unless you are 100% sure that that child knows exactly what they're supposed to be doing. If they know that expectation and it's clear and they're being a jerk, that's different. Um, but there are often times where we just assume that they know and they don't. Um, so I know I kind of just blew through the last little section there. Um, but I appreciate you guys taking some time to listen. Um, and hopefully some of these tips were different or helpful. Um, but yeah, so you guys are happy to stick around and answer questions as needed. So does anyone have any questions? That was great. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. OK, if you wouldn't mind filling out the evaluation for me and um, and Kate said she'll stick around for a little bit if you have additional questions. Okay, the first. Yeah. What, um, what tips do you have for motivating an athlete in an area of non Okay. I love this question. So, what you want to think about is where are your kids' strengths. Um, so, there's some really fun little questionnaires out there. Like I think it's like Zaya character tracer. Yes, I love that. Book. Yeah. Um, so, and I, what I might do is send I'll a link. To you. Okay. Yeah. So, I, I know I have a link for it. Yeah. So, I'll, I'll send it to. Portia along okay. with some of these oh, slides. Everybody should know this. Um, but it's really cool because, mm -hmm. so just as an example, when you pair a strength with a non preferred activity, okay. it's going to go a lot better. Okay. So, um, when I, I've had kids, just as an example, where I'm trying to figure out how to get them to manage weight better, needing them to get moving more, um, you know, 
you can have them listen to a favorite YouTube video, mm -hmm. watch it on the treadmill. Um, or, you know, for me, I hate doing chores, but I love learning. And so I will listen to entertaining podcasts while I'm cleaning the house or while I'm doing dishes. And so finding a way to pair something that they're good at, something that they're confident with, with something that they don't have motivation for, the better. Um, reinforcement is always great. It just depends. Because um, what happens is a lot of times we don't think about the um, saliency of a, of a reward. So how strong or potent is that reward? So personal example, when I was in grad school, we um, learned about behavior modification. And we were supposed to, as part of an assignment, change one of our behaviors. And I am a terrible snoozer in the morning. And I am obsessed with coffee. And so as punishment to me, I was not allowed to give myself coffee creamer. And I would have to drink my coffee black. So fun story, I started drinking black coffee and liking black coffee because the reward of the extra time for sleep was more powerful than the coffee creamer. So you have to think about what, what your reinforcers are too. Yeah. And ask them. Ask them what would be helpful. So, and sometimes it doesn't have to be something tangible. It could be, you know what, you get to pick what we have to eat for night, for, for dinner. Right? It's yeah. mac, mac and cheese or chicken nuggets, right? And you're going to be like, all right, I'm going to eat mac and cheese with you or chicken nuggets. Um, so, or, you know, picking out the TV show for an evening, watching it together. Or, um, you know, there's a lot of different different strategies. And another thing, too, with reinforcement especially is it's going to be more powerful if you're doing it immediately mm -hmm. after the behavior as yeah. opposed to waiting. So a lot of times, um, you know, parents will say, all right, well, when you get home, we're going to give you this. Or if you wait five days, we're going to do mm -hmm. this. And it's just like, oh, I don't care anymore. Mm -hmm. So yeah. so that's important. Well, I, also, it was, I was visiting with a previous student that I taught and her mother. And her mother said, I've learned that with Caroline, I can not I can just say I have a surprise, but I can't tell her the surprise. Or else she wants to do it right then. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. like mom wanted to run errands, and then eventually they were going to go to her favorite shop or whatever. But she's like, don't tell me where we're going, or else I'll have no patience. But like the child was in eighth grade and knew this. Yeah. But like the idea of even saying we're going to go buy or get yogurt, mm -hmm. the time waiting for that for that child, yeah, right. she then would That's have been like, brutal. can we go? When are we going to be here? When are we going to be here? Brilliant. Well, because until you get to the size and you keep mm -hmm. diminishing what yeah. it is, yeah. right? Yeah. Because you have to keep waiting, and then it's not even worth know. it. Like yeah. I was, it's miserable. Yeah. Um, but I thought that would make you said that this eighth grader could explain. I tell my mom not to tell me, so that I can be a better waiter. That's a great example. Because life has, we're done, we're done with that, you 